so much for coming to our best practices for ELA differentiation grades six through 12. We appreciate you being here today. First and foremost, we want to thank the New Hampshire Department of Education. Um, we partner with them on these and the, we are able to bring you these webinars for free. So we appreciate um, their our work together with them. You are muted. We can't hear you. So um, you're good to go that way. We do not really um, have the ability to use the raise a hand feature on the webinar. Um, it gets a little bit sticky. So if you could please ask any of your questions in the Q&A, Marissa or I will be feeding them to one another as we go through. So definitely type anything in there and, and shoot them our, the way, our way and we'll um, answer them um, when we can. Uh, first and foremost really here is tomorrow you'll get an email it's 24 hours after the ending of this webinar, so you won't get it in the morning, but it will be in the afternoon. You'll have a li link to the PD certificate. It will um, let you know where a video of this webinar will end up being posted. It will give you a link to um, the PowerPoint and any other information that we have within the webinar folder. Last, we have a survey that will pop up as soon as we log off or you log off of this particular webinar. It's a few questions. Um, we definitely look at it. Um, if you've been on these webinars before, I'll just say it again. It's a, just a few seconds. We really appreciate any feedback you have to be able to make these um, sessions even better. Um, this particular differentiation webinar um, is actually much changed since last year um, because we got the feedback. So definitely keep it coming. We appreciate it. For today, I'm Heather Jenkins. I will be um, one of the people presenting today. I also have my colleague, Marissa Hooper here. Hi, everyone. She'll be presenting part of this. Kristen Crawford um, was hoping to be able to pop on um, at some point, but I know she has um, another meeting going on, but she her direct contact information will be at the end of this if you ever have any questions for her. For essential understandings today, I'm gonna turn my camera off here um, just so you have a little bit more space that you can see on your screen. Um, so we're going to gain a better understanding of how data, really in any form, can help us um, manage and meet the needs of all of our students. And we're going to talk about how we can enhance the understanding um, of the components of effective literacy instruction to meet our diverse needs of our students. And we're really talking a lot today about tier one instruction, not necessarily just tier two and three, but really tier one and those small things we might be able to do in our classroom that make a large difference. The first section here, I want to talk just to make sure we're all on the same page. Differentiation has a lot of different ways that people are talking about it. So we just created a word cloud here. There's a lot of um, words that are sort of encompassed in what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, a lot about rigors. Um, we're gonna look at student data. Some people will think of this as what they might be doing for RTI, um, for universal design for learning, and just in general. So I wanna go through some of these, some of the, the big um, sort of um, ways that people are are talking about um, differentiating instruction in their classroom. And that first and foremost is that differentiated instruction. It's looking at um, the diverse needs of your students, recognizing their learning styles and all their abilities and interests and being able to work with all of those to be able to, to um, change your instruction accordingly. Another sort of term that's out there right now is personalized learning. And that's customizing your the learning experience to meet a specific need and interests of individual students um, and really looking at technology um, to provide adaptive and student dri driven learning paths. Universal design for learning or UDL is also something that people talk about when they're thinking about differentiation. And UDL is really that framework that you put everything into that helps take away a lot of barriers and thinking about what those barriers might be before you're teaching. Um, so that's another way that um, we're thinking about differentiation. Responsive teaching is basically taking a look at the students in front of you right now 
and their particular needs and knowing where they are at any given time and adjusting your teaching strategies accordingly. And then another um, term that's out there is equitable instruction. So this is making sure that we are making um, our instruction able to be um, really looked at or understood by all students that we're making sure that we're thinking about being culturally diverse and um, we're looking at um, all students having that high quality education and opportunities. For today, not that we're not we're looking at all of these and a combination of all of these, but we're really going to look at a combination of differentiated instruction, universal design for learning, and responsive teaching. So for us, what we're looking at differentiation is it's fully seeing and knowing and planning for the actual students in front of you each and every day. This does not mean that you're doing 16 different lessons. So I want to be clear about that. We're going to talk about some of the ways that we can incorporate this into our classrooms, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about some of these ways to make it more manageable. So when we're looking at this and we're thinking about differentiation, we really want to make sure that we're looking at keeping those standards high for all students and not just assuming that students are coming in lower and lowering our expectations. So we, we really want to ensure that students um, have that opportunity to reach their full potentials um, and getting sort of, you can see the, the picture there, to the top of the ladder. Right. We're not going to we're not going to bring things down to what our lowest level is just so that everybody can be successful. We're going to pull them along with us. There's differentiation doesn't have the best reputation right now. Um, I think whenever um, a teacher hears the word differentiation, all they can think of is like, OK, now I have more on my plate. I need to differentiate. And how am I actually going to do this? So. What one of the misconceptions is, is that you do have to generate a lot of resources, and that's not necessarily the case. What we're going to be talking about today is changing up and switching up things a little bit and really looking at what we're doing within our teaching practices that will automatically differentiate. The other uh, misconception that, that folks has have is really a clear understanding of how this can impact um, tier one instruction. A lot of times when people think of differentiation, they think about tier two and tier three or trying to work with students who just aren't getting it, but that's not necessarily the case. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Some things that differentiation requires, we need to make sure that we know what the requirements are within our particular grade level. Right. There are a lot of times, especially in middle and high school, we're looking at classes that have been done for a certain amount of time um, and we might be inheriting a class. And what we always want to make sure of is that we are completely dialed in to what students should be understanding and what they should be secure with by the time they leave our classes or are finished up with that particular course. We also um, need to make sure that we are responding to the needs of your students in your planning. So there will be some things that you can do on the fly, but then other things you want to make sure that you're planning for um, that particular differentiation and ensuring also that we are um, constructing, constructing lessons for the diverse needs of all of our students. So if we have students that we know um, have different learning styles, we need to make sure is as we're teaching that we are keeping those particular things in mind. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have all sorts of data on the students that are coming to you, but what you start to do is build up your toolbox and you think about things that you have used for particular students and now that you might be able to use more for all students. So just to make sure it's crystal clear, things that are not differentiated, we cannot talk at students or ask students just to complete something, right? We're not standing up at the board and it's not just task completion. We're not just repeating those particular tasks or our teachings um, until a grade level test. 
We are not moving on to the next topics just so that we can make sure to cover everything. We wanna make sure that students are understanding. And then it's differentiation really is not a once in a blue moon thing. It's not, okay, on this day, we're gonna differentiate. It's really embedded into our instruction and we're gonna show you a few ways to do that. And what we also wanna make clear of is differentiation is not individualized instruction for every student. That's a form of differentiation for sure. That's not necessarily what we're talking about today. Um, what we're talking about today is a little bit more of getting to know your students in really meaningful ways. I know it's hard in the middle and high school um, grades because you have so many classes in your day. In elementary, you have the same students typically day in and day out. But what we want to really start to, to focus on is to know where our students are, where they are as learners, and really the, where they are as humans as well, to know this is what we um, need to be providing to be able to ensure that they're learning. You want also to make sure that you're creating that culture and expectation that all students can learn. And that sometimes kids take a different path to do that. Specifically with math, we've been seeing a lot of information um, coming out about math trauma and math anxiety. And for years, we've heard kids say, well, I'm not a math kid. Or you've heard in maybe your ELA classes, oh, I'm not a reading kid, or oh, I just don't like history. Um, and that just is not, that's not what we're going to accept. We're going to continue to make sure that these students have high expectations and that they understand that they can learn. And then having those clear goals for students, we know the more that students know about why they're learning something, the better they do. Um, and then consistently reviewing that understanding and where students are at and proof that they are learning to make those instructional choices. So here's some instruction essentials. You'll hear it all day or all for the next another 45 minutes. You need to know your students and you need to know them well. You need to know your content and know the content well. You don't just though now need to know what your content is specifically for your class. Yes, you do, but you also need to know where the students are coming from so that you know how to kind of scaffold that as well. You need to be creative and flexible in your thinking. We cannot teach the same way we taught 10 years ago in our classrooms. It's not working. So we need to do something different. We need to be flexible in our thinking. Again, you need to have the belief that all students can learn. Even if a kid comes down every day and puts their head on their desk, we need to believe that that student can learn and there's something that is prohibiting them from wanting to access that that understanding. So we've got some other things we're going to be talking about with that. Also, having a clear sense of what students should know and be able to do. Most of the time we have that. If you have a program and you're just following the program, you want to make sure that you're dialed in a little bit more to those overarching themes so you know when you can move on and when you can just, um, and when you might need to stop because they need to be able to get um, that particular understanding because it's really crucial for what's coming up next. Having a classroom culture of students being able to take risks, be vulnerable, have their own choice making and respecting differences is going to be key. And that toolkit that I was talking about building over time, we want to make sure that if we have some things that have worked for students in the past, and um, we know that it was, you know, something fun that they did or something that they really connected to, use it again. Do, do that particular thing again, even if you don't have students that might need that, you feel like, in your class. And we need to make sure that we have ongoing um, assessment and really dialed in tasks. What I want to talk about really quickly is having that clear sense of what um, students should know and be able to do in your classroom. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So we have to have learning outcomes. So many times I've been seeing um, in middle and high school that the learning outcomes are in a workbook or they're somewhere in the back of the room and we never really talk about them, but we say, yep, you can refer to that if you want to know what you're learning. 
These learning outcomes need to be talked about all throughout your lessons. These kids need to know where they're going. It's like, if I were to say to you, all right, hop in the car, here we go. We're going to go somewhere. And you're gonna, there's no way you're going to do that without saying like, okay, Heather, what, what are we doing? You, we, we need to really be clear about where they're going and why they are learning what they're learning on a particular day. And it can't be because this is a required class. Um, it is, here's what I need you to be able to do at the end. This is what we're doing today to be able to feed into that and make sure that you know, um, what you're doing, um, when we get to the end, because we need this to be able to do that. So looking at learning outcomes, we should always know, have, um, on the sort of front of mind, what we want students to know, what information do they need to know? The bigger concepts are what do they really need to understand? Contextually, what do they need to be able to understand? Not just like spit out the fact type of things. And then what will they be able to do and how are they going to be able to apply this and show me what they know? The be able to do is not just they do this task. It is what are those things that they might be able to analyze or determine or to figure out to be able to um, figure out maybe the central ideal of something or to um, shape what their their understanding is and be flexible in their understanding. So we respond to redifferentiate by being flexible in our methods and materials. So if you're teaching a class, you want to have lots of different materials that you're able um, to have students um, have access to, and you want to have your methods change. You don't want to necessarily use PowerPoint or Google Slides every single day, right? We want to be able to switch that up. We want to model as much as possible and offer a variety of examples whenever possible. And then we need to make sure that we are eliciting that background knowledge. Sometimes we assume that kids are coming in with background knowledge, an example would be not even just background knowledge on whatever you're reading or whatever you're you're talking about for your particular class, but the background knowledge of how to collaborate. If you're asking kids to collaborate and you're asking them to talk in your classroom, you need to really make sure that they are are doing are able to do that because we assume sometimes in middle and high school that they can, but they're they're actually not super great at it. So we want to build that background knowledge and, and understanding of some of those things. Obviously, we want also to provide think time. It's essential. Kids need a little bit longer to think. If we're just letting kids spit out the answer or we're calling on the first person that is raising their hand, those kids that that take a little bit more time are just going to shut down. And then we, we want to really explain all the concepts that we can in more than one way, right? If we're explaining it one way, we can't just explain it again the same way and think they just weren't listening the first time. They didn't understand it the first time. So we have to think about a different way to, to explain it. <clears throat> so differentiation isn't effective without quality universal instruction. That is key. Tier one universal instruction. We can't do differentiation without that being effective. Again, we're not just differentiating to just differentiate. We want to really be intentional in our planning and think about where our students are as we plan. If we are differentiating, we want to know what the purpose of it is. Sometimes people differentiate and they say, oh, yeah, I'm doing all of this and all of these things. But why are we doing it? We just want to make sure we understand the why. And then we want to plan for those outcomes. What do we want students to be able to do at the end of this? What um, are those things that students need to know um, and be able to, to um, provide information about their knowledge of? And then we want to adjust based on what students are able to do and what their outcomes are. We're going to talk a little bit here about data. Um, as well coming up and how we might be able to use different types of data to be able to um, differentiate and be able to do that on the fly as well. So this next part, I'm going to pass off to my colleague and we're going to talk about the data. Yeah, so we really wanted to incorporate in here um, how we can use 
data from our students to differentiate on the fly in our classrooms. Um, so just to remember um, what Heather was talking about, in order to do this, um, we really need to know our students, um, any their abilities, interests that they have, um, the way that they learn in different ways, um, accommodations on IEPs and 504s, and needs that students have beyond differentiation. We also need to know our content, um, the standards, learning objectives and success criteria, um, making sure that students know what they need to be able to do to be successful, um, like Heather was saying earlier. Um, and then we really need to ensure that we are keeping our expectations high for our students. So the tier two is growing um, and that the middle is growing. So teaching to the middle is not working and we need to make sure that we are teaching to the top of the spectrum. And we need to have that use of ongoing assessment. So continually assessing our students. And I'm not talking about, you know, um, uh, pencil and paper reading assessment. Um, we're going to go into that a little bit of exactly how we're going to assess students and where they're at um, through the use of formal and informal assessments. And then making sure we're collecting the right data to differentiate and to respond to our students. So data really drives our ability to respond to the students in front of us and what they need in that moment. Um, so through the collection of data, we can respond better. And we differentiate through that um, responsive teaching. So when we're talking about data here, um, we, we want you to expand your definition of what we're talking about when we're thinking of data. So anything that students show us about who they are, how they learn and how they interact with the world is data. Um, and it's not only data, but it's valid data. So even a conversation that you have with a student um, that you're kind of keeping in your head, that is very valid and you can use that to help differentiate for what that student needs. So um, a conversation in the hallway, evaluating a writing sample from a student um, or hearing students talk during a book club can allow you to use information and use what you're hearing in order to help them with what they need. So we're talking about tier one instruction and the collection of data through that. So this is just a graphic to show kind of that, um, you know, what we're doing in our classroom consistently. So we're assessing informally um, our students constantly. Where are they at? What do they need? And we're collecting that data. Um, it can be in our head. It can be on spreadsheets. It can be on a uh, note-taking template with your students' names down. But we're collecting, um, and we're going to talk about what this informal um, assessments are, but we're collecting that. And then we're using that, and we're responding to what our students need, what they're showing us, and how we need to kind of switch up what we're doing. Um, and then we're repeating that cycle continually in our tier one instruction. So we talked about formal data and we talked about informal data. So formal data are really those, you know, unit assessments, any progress monitoring or um, universal screening tools or uh, New Hampshire SAS or the SAT. So that can really help us differentiate our interventions with students. Um, and what we're talking about um, for the data that we're using is the informal data. And that differentiates tier one instruction because this is going to help us differentiate on the fly. Not, not finding, right, those 10 different resources for where kids at, but on the fly, this is what students need. How can I give it to them? So this informal data collection, um, we're talking about exit tickets, you know, giving students and exit ticket to figure out what they understood from your lesson or kind of where they're at within the lesson. Um, your conferences with students and then conferences that students have with each other as well. Um, your observations, so their writing, their reading, um, what they're doing in your classroom. Uh, their discussions, again, with each other and um, the discussions that you have with them. Right. Even going back to that hallway example, even if it's not in your ELA classroom, 
um, those discussions, you're still collecting data from the students. And then also their engagement, um, which can be surprising, but collecting data about um, how they're engaging in your class can help you respond to their needs as well. And we're gonna go through each one of these and how we can respond. So when giving exit tickets in conferences, um, we, we collect data by, we can gather this exit ticket evi evidence on a practice skill. Um, again, like we said, you can use spreadsheets, you can have that kind of note-taking uh, template as you um, record how students are doing. Um, maintaining anecdotal records of their goals and the progress that they're making towards those goals. And reflections that your students are having through writing, drawing, um, you know, where they think that they're at in their learning. So when we collect this data, um, it's really going to help us respond to our students um, because we can strategically form small groups. So um, anything that student needs, even if it's like a behavior or academic reasons, strategically forming these groups so that they can get what they need for your classroom. Scaffolding texts and writing tasks, um, and then letting those scaffolds go. So kind of having those in your toolbox to figure out how you can set um, it up so that if students need it, they can use it, and then how you can, over time, take it away. And providing a wide range of text, media, audio, and visuals. So having different um, modes of the way you present uh, material can be uh, super helpful. And then engaging students in goal setting and self-monitoring. So kind of leading back to that success criteria and making sure that students know, um, as Heather's example, where they're going. Um, so that they're able to set their own goals and kind of monitor where they're at and also be able to hopefully, you know, once they're in high school, even middle school, identify what they need and advocate for themselves. So through observations and discussions, um, we've given some examples, but really we're just collecting the data. Um, we're observing their reading, writing, speaking, and listening behaviors. So their behaviors during this time um, can help us figure out what our students need. Um, listening to recordings of students reading aloud, um, having them read their writing, um, and responding to reading um, can help us figure out what uh, our students need. And noticing and noting student talk with each other um, is a big one. Collaboration with students can really tell us a lot. Um, a lot of times they're much more honest with their, with their peers than maybe with you. So um, kind of noticing the discussions with each other can help you figure out what they need. And once we have this anecdotal data, um, we can model what it means um, or how to be a good reader, writer um, in speaking and listening and providing thinking stems or conversation frames. So if they need um, prompting, making sure that we have those types of questions that we can give students if they are struggling. And then establishing structures and routines for a whole class discussion um, and showing them like how to take part in a whole class discussion and what that should look like. Also partner um, in group for e in group work for ELA. And lastly, we just want to uh, bring in student engagement and how um, we can differentiate and collect data for how students um, are behaving or what their body language is looking like. So really observing, um, their engagement with your class, uh, their self-regulation um, and any body language, if they're crouched um, on their desk, if they're falling asleep, if they're, um, you know, very talkative. So observing that. Um, and noting any preferences and behaviors. Um, again, really knowing your students, um, knowing when something is off or not. And with this, we can um, respond to them 
and respond to our students by adapting our lessons according to the level of motivation or engagement. So if we see that students um, need a break or need to get up and move around, uh, making sure that we are able to respond to them by giving them that option. Um, and using timers and sticky notes can help students manage time and really chunk tasks for them. And lastly, we just want you to be curious about if a student is disengaged um, versus making an assumption about why they may be. Because sometimes, or a lot of times, it goes much deeper um, for why a student is not engaged and can really be why they are not under, really, it can really be that, you know, students just aren't understanding what's what's happening. And we need to make sure that we address that and give them what they need. Okay, so next we wanna talk about transferring to the classroom. So um, this um, particular quote is, um, really what we're talking about here is when we're talking and establishing um, what our students are able to do. Um, an asset-based lens is a much more effective way um, to go for all students. So if we're talking about deficit, it's, um, yeah, that was great, but you need to do this and this and this and this, or you didn't do this, or and anytime they get their writing back, all it has is the red on it that says all the things that they need to fix. What we're trying to do now in, in getting students to be um, a little bit more involved is that more of an asset-based lens and having students understanding what they are doing really well. Not that we're just sitting there all around and you know pumping everybody up all day and everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets the A, but everybody needs to know what they're doing well and then a way that they can also improve. So this is just sort of pointing that out there. We're talking tier one. Again, this is not necessarily, you can use some of these things in tier two and tier three for sure. But um, we're talking about these big, th three big things um, for um, looking at our tier one instruction is high quality instructional materials, right? We need, especially um, for ELA, um, we can't, it, it, our texts, there are some really great texts out there that are, that are, um, that are new and exciting and really, um, engaging for students. So we want to make sure that we're, we're putting that in there as well. We want to make sure that we have really good instructional supports and interventions if needed. If a student is special ed and they're in your classroom, they are also your class, they are your responsibility. They are not just special ed. So we wanna make sure we have instructional supports and interventions for everybody. Um, and then those formative assessments to be able to capture student strengths and weaknesses um, is, is going to be crucial as well. So when we talk about planning for all, we're talking about everybody. Right. So this is every student who walks into your classroom. We are going to um, the supports that we're going to use are explicit strategy instruction. So strategies that students are needing, they need explicit explicit instruction on. Um, we can talk about supporting through modeling, think alouds. We want to include multimedia text sets. Um, we want to um, use grade level vocabulary um, with repetition as well. So those are ways that we can plan for all. And then teaching and assessing considerations is making sure that we're intentionally choosing the times for whole class instruction, times for conferring, times for small groups or independent work time. We want to identify and remove potential barriers. So if we know that students are coming in and they have um, a hard time understanding things or they have a specific need of, you know, like maybe a checklist or what have you, that we are removing that and maybe everybody has a checklist. Um, and then we're looking at maybe alternate ways of assessing students. There's some students that can show you their understanding in other ways, and it's not always just on um, pencil and paper. 
And then we want to emphasize routines and practice and summary of things. So one of the ways that um, a lot of teachers are really good at differentiating is this use of chunking or scaffolding. So looking at what you're teaching, chunking it up in ways that makes it manageable for students to be able to obtain the information. The scaffolding, we're also, um, a lot of us are doing a really good job of scaffolding and being able to make sure that they have those prerequisite skills or that we're able to scaffold the information and make it so that it's accessible to you. But the point with scaffolding here is that we also want to make sure that any scaffolds that we put in place at some point go away, that we don't just scaffold all the time, that we are really dialed into when students don't need those scaffolds anymore and that we're able to take those away. So some things about what teachers do during differentiation or just in general in a classroom with really effective tier one instruction. You're moving around the classroom during um, all student work time. You're also moving around the classroom during your teaching time um, and not just teaching at the board for the whole lesson. You're gonna gather and utilize information. There are a lot of things that you are able to find as you are looking and walking throughout the room. So you wanna make sure you're doing that. You wanna offer verbal feedback, make sure that um, students get that feedback, not just on paper, but verbally. Um, again, scaffold instructions or questions, take a look at your depth of knowledge that you're, you're requiring for students and make sure that it's appropriate. And then you're gonna actively seek evidence of student understanding. Students also have stake in this and what they're doing um, during differentiation is especially in middle and high school is they're gonna have specific goals for themselves and you know, give them that ability to take ownership of their learning. You're gonna make sure that they know um, how to ask for help. Um, so many times the way um, that students ask for help is they don't. They just put their head down on their desk and that we accept that. Today, they're just gonna have their head down and I'm gonna continue going because I have 22 students in my class and that one student puts their head down on their desk all the time and I'm just gonna let it go. And we're not just gonna let that go. We're gonna make sure that we're, we're, we're understanding what that particular student needs. They, if we are giving them any sort of resources, they're using those resources. It's not just a, if you feel like using it, there are going to be times where you're going to say every single person is going to use this resource today. And then that way um, students are able to get and to work with those resources that really need it. You're going to collaborate. They're going to collaborate with peers and they're going to follow the structures or routines. Again, we're not just gonna say, well, that student doesn't need to do that today. So when it comes to whole class structures and routines for reading, we're, some of the things that we would suggest is you read aloud often. And that's even in middle school and high school. You wanna read aloud, you want the texts to be all different types of texts. You want it to be visual, um, you want maybe digital, maybe they have them in their hands. You want to do th to think alouds um, and model what it is to think about, um, you know, and and um, really talk about their understanding of what of what either you've read or they've read. Um, you want to these carefully curated text sets. This is what we're talking about. We want to make sure also that they are of student interest right? And that there's a lot of different types of texts. Um, and then as you get more complex into um, the reading that um, they've had that, that wide variety so that they've built that, that background knowledge. We also want to make sure that we're teaching vocabulary through a wide range of experiences. It's not just here's the vocabulary, let's memorize it, but we want a, a lot of different experiences for them to understand that vocabulary. And then um, we wanna use partners, groups, whole discussions, and then model um, and lead students through text annotation um, and based on your goals for that particular day. With writing, 
We want to use example texts or mentor texts, right? We want to use different genres, forms, and structures. We want to provide um, graphic organizers. Um, they should be available for all students when they're planning writing at the sentence paragraph or full text level. Um, include time for micro writing. That's little tiny things where you're able to just do quick writes um, and build stamina. And then also um, we wanna make sure we have time for choice writing. Um, sometimes we're, we have to you know, stay within a particular topic area, but then other times they should just be able to write about whatever their choosing is based on a certain set of um, criteria and transferring whatever you're doing for your teaching to that. Explicitly teaching the stages of the writing process um, and have students explore and establish their own processes. Again, once we get up into middle and high school, we assume that they know the stages of writing and um, that is just not the case for a lot of students. We wanna model and engage students in collaborative feedback routines. Um, writer share is amazing in any classroom. So it helps build that community Maybe you have a writer's cafe, or maybe they're just um, sharing something that they um, have that is a favorite line from what they wrote, or maybe a, what, a, what a partner had written. And then allow flexibility of, of materials when you can. We, you, you all know as, as ELA teachers, the, you know, how sort of connected reading, writing, speaking, and listening are. And, and certainly there is explicit instruction on each one of those, but we wanna make sure that that relationship between them is, is really um, you know, put forth um, during our lessons as well. So structured class to include small groups for reading and writing. Um, some some uh, thoughts for that is to alternate core text with book clubs. Obviously you're gonna intentionally intentionally choose those texts or themes or content or um, creating individual groups um, dependent on your um, student goals. And so maybe you'll have um, small group instruction led by teachers or even students. Um, having student-led groups for writing feedback is um, super helpful. Um, formative or summative assessment data um, so that you can um, plan for that small group experience. So you wanna use those types of assessments to be able to do that. So for um, whole class or small group tools, these are some of the reading tools that we have. These are just some, some general resources that we have that we wanted to share with you. Um, here's some writing resources here. They're all linked. And then this one is specifically on classroom routines. Um, so these are some different resources that might um, be useful for you. So as you get the slide deck tomorrow, um, these will all be on there. Um, so for structured class um, to include independent practice, what we wanna do is we wanna integrate independent reading and writing time throughout the week. Right. We want to establish classroom routine of what independent practice time looks like, sounds like, and feels like. Um, reading and writing engagement inventories and student self-reflection um, can also be um, a way to be able to, to help um, drive your instruction. And then the, the student choice is... Um, important. Sometimes they can choose different aspects of it, but maybe let them choose how or where they read or write throughout the week. Um, and then to um, get into the routine of conferring um, during independent reading and writing time, um, as well as to collect that formative data and to build those relationships. So independent practice time tools here, we have integrated reading and writing responses on the side here. Um, engagement is over here. And sorry, um, this is off the page. 
Um, I, there's a problem with the formatting here. I'll get it so that it's formatted correctly. The one on the right here um, is all about conferring. So you'll be able to, to see some of these different tools um, for um, how you might be able to use these in your classroom. Whenever we're differentiating, we want to keep those student characteristics in mind. So the interest, readiness, and learning profile of each student. Obviously, interest is a hard one right now. Um, I feel like it's ever-changing. And I used to feel like I could keep up with it. Um, but it, it's definitely something that is of utmost important to our students is that interest. If they're not interested, it makes it challenging to to hook in um, a, a number of students. So we wanna keep their interests in mind. The readiness is, is also something that's a challenge for us because what used to be readiness in our classroom um, is, is ever changing um, with what um, sort of has been going on in the world for the last few years. So we wanna make sure that um, when we're thinking about student readiness that um, we wanna make sure that we're promoting growth no matter where they're coming in. And then that learning profile and understanding um, the way that different students um, learn is, is nothing really new to us. We just wanna make sure we're keeping that in mind. So to increase interest, these are some things you can do. We obviously want a wide selection of text, texts um, and rate grade level content. We want the complexity to be um, ranging from, you know, a, a less complex to mo more complex. Um, and we want to make sure that we're culturally responsive. Um, when it comes to um, technology, we want to look at whenever we're doing reading, writing, speaking, or listening, that we have some technology that supports that as well. And then to be able to model choice making and invite students um, to make choices can help build that student agency. And then incorporate student interests into pop culture, right? That's again, it's tricky for me. <laughs> but um, for this, um, a lot of times when, when students are doing any sort of speaking or writing in the classroom, we, we are, we want to be able to help them find that authentic audience for them to be able to know what they need to do for their um, speaking and writing. And then um, emphasizing those connections um, between what the content is and where students are. And then um, this is something that I feel like we're we're pretty good at, but the, with the range of sort of texts or, or understanding in different literature, but that cultural knowledge that students are bringing to school can sometimes be a little bit more challenging. So we want to make sure that we're honoring that as well. When we're looking at readiness, um, the ways that we can think about readiness and, and differentiate is use um talk as a tool to build confidence with writers. So you're talking with them um, and allowing them to write things down as they're speaking with you. We want um, those carefully curated texts um, and independent practice time for students. Again, add or remove those scaffolds um, when needed um, and take them away when they are not needed. We want to adjust the content based on background knowledge that student have, students have, and then vary the content in presentation modes. Again, if you're using PowerPoint, not using that every day, maybe some days there's a video, maybe some days um, you're writing on the board or, or um, just making sure that you're mixing it up a little bit. When we're thinking about um, different learning profiles and we're looking at um, what we might be able to do for different learning um, profiles. Um, we are thinking about flexible spaces and grouping or learning options for folks. Um, again, presentation methods and student work and how they're showing that needs to be switched up every once in a while. 
student choice is big. It doesn't mean that they get to choose everything, but just giving them sort of a, a, a little bit of choice here and there is, is super helpful. Um, varied materials for everybody to use. So you might have kids that need extension. You might have kids that um, need um, scaffolding, but everybody should have access to that at all times. It's really the easiest way to differentiate and then to provide authentic learning opportunities for folks. This here is um, just a slide to be able to promote um, and elicit thinking for all different types of students. And so you can refer to this um, and um, it's most of it is, is you know, we're, we're relatively good at doing this, but um, sometimes I, I just like a different way to ask a question and the way that you ask questions can be a game changer for being able to have students really solidify their understanding and thinking. So we thought these would be helpful. This next one is um, when we're talking about maximizing the relationship between reading, writing, speaking, and listening, um, these are just some ways um, the, that we can um, do that. So we're going to um, model, we're going to encourage the use of technology, and we're gonna teach students to be able to set goals to monitor growth. And that the digital tools for asynchronous conversations is also really helpful. Again, knowing your learning targets, being clear on what you want students to know, understand and be able to do. This is just an example. This is a pretty simple example. This might, you know, uh, we were looking at this and we're like, okay, this is typically tends to be um, more of an elementary, but if you want students to write an essay to demonstrate the phases of butterfly metamorphosis, what's your target? Is it making sure they're writing an essay or do you need them to know about butterfly, butterfly metamorphosis? You need to be clear on exactly which portion of that you want students to be able to do. So if you want them to un, you know, give you an understanding of the phases of butterfly metamorphosis, maybe it doesn't have to be an essay. It could be something else, right? Or if you want them to um, write an essay, maybe it doesn't have to be on butterfly metamorphosis. So this is just ways that we can kind of, of switch that up just a little bit. Again, it's all about choice. Choice increases engagement. So we need um, to know um, really what our students um interests are, right? And have them be engaged in that. They have to be able to access the education for them also to have um, high engagement. So these are just some ways in which you can increase um, engagement in your classroom. Providing the choices in text, tiered tasks, using um, modeling tools, um, both high-tech and low-tech throughout the year. Um, so these are, this is just a list of things. If you want to um, allow choice in what students are producing, um, these are just different ways that they can, um, you know, be able to show their understanding and in, in the ways that students with these particular learning styles might, might choose to be able to show their understanding. So um, this quote is just, it's essential for us to know what this, our student differences are. And if we don't understand where their differences in learning are, then we're not necessarily going to maximize potential um, of our students in our classroom. So we really want to know where our kids are. This, the, in, and it says those who, di who differ significantly from the norm, that's exactly um, what we're talking about when Marissa was talking earlier about like we're teaching to the middle um, we think that's the norm, but that's no longer the norm. Um, so we need to make sure that we're looking at the kids that are all the students in our classroom and the whole spectrum of, of learning abilities and teaching um, to, the, to the edges rather than to the middle. There's some tech tools to support and access differentiation. Again, these are just some um, quick um, um, 
things that might be helpful for you. Um, this is um, how you can um, have your students post their individual thinking um, on a, a Padlet. You can put digital texts on there. You can have tiered lessons on there. Google Docs is also um, good to, it, this moat extension allows you to audio comment. So instead of writing your comments, you can put them on audio and then it will be a clip that's right on a student's piece of writing. So that can be helpful. And then um, choice boards for Google Slides and, and all of that might be might be helpful as well. When it comes to universal design for learning, um, I'm not sure if Lynette is on um, with us today, but she is the main contact for um, the universal design for learning and the New, New Hampshire Department of Education. They've been working with CAST for a number of years. Um, this is going to be the last year that they're working with CAST and then they're going to be um, doing this solely through the Department of Education. Not that CAST isn't great and that we um, have learned so much from them, but they also wanna make sure that they're doing everything that they can at the NHED to be able to continue to support you um, in that, using that framework to be able to differentiate your instruction. So we wanted to make sure to have her um, information on here for you. And then this is a time where um, if you have any questions or thoughts or like anything answered, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And I just wanted to get to our um, information here. You can reach out to any of us at any time if you have any questions. I think that's everything that we have. Um, so thank you again for being here this afternoon. And we look forward to um, possibly seeing you in person at some point or um, having you attend another webinar. Take care. Thanks, everyone.